Welcome to the fight with Teddy Alice, presented by Dynamic Striking. I'm Ken Rideout, joined as always by the voice of all combat sports, the legend Teddy Alice. Teddy, how you doing? Good, good. I'm getting better with the knee. Just got back from Manhattan, where I do some of my rehab over there with the good people at HSS, Giacomo, and also over here at Staten Island. I supplemented a couple of days when I can't get into the city. I supplement. I want to keep going. I don't want to, you know, do two, three days a week. I want to do five, six days a week. So uh, I supplement. I saw you pushing the sled. You look, you look like you're in better shape than before you hurt your knee. Yeah, well, no, no, no. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm doing, I'm, I'm pushing, you know, just... Uh, Doing what you got to do, trying to help yourself. That's right. Because uh, nobody can help you if you don't have the will to help yourself. So That's right. I'm glad. I, I mean, I'm fortunate. I, I said it many times. I'm, I have good people around me uh, besides the ones in Manhattan. I got people on Staten Island uh, like Dr. Piaz and Steve, the physical therapist over here, that are making time for me, working me in around my schedule, which is always hard to do uh, and not always convenient. So... I'm I'm very fortunate. Yeah, if I don't push, they got me pushing the sled, like you said. You know the way I look at it. If if I don't get back to being a a boxing trainer, at least I'll be able to go into football camp. You know, um, and uh, <laughs> I'll be able to I'll be able to push that sled uh, up the hill a little bit. But the other thing is, we got an eclipse coming today, so I hope everybody out there that's gearing up for we're gonna miss it because we're with you, the fans. See what we miss for you? We 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 look. You do for us, we do for you. You're there for us, we're there for you. It's a two way street. We never forget that, and um, we're gonna miss the eclipse. But then again. Uh, knowing the way I'm reckless and I messed my knee up, I I probably would have went blind uh, if I, uh, <laughs> you know, if I had, because I probably wouldn't have to write glasses to the glasses. I mean, there's a lot of frauds out there, Sam, that are, you know, selling knockoffs that you got to be careful. You got to get the right glasses to look at it. But um, that'll be going on. It's the next one will be coming along. You and Rob and Sam can see the next one. Me? No. <laughs> because it, <laughs> it, it'll be in uh, 2045 or something like that. I'm not so sure that I'll be able to see it or I'll be around to see it. But you guys, you guys will. Remember that. Remember today that I said when you're watching it that I said um, enjoy <laughs> the eclipse uh, in 45. The other thing is I'm getting ready to fly out to Charlie Monaghan, the man, the the director out there with all the good people, Charles Sonnen and Anthony Smith and and DC and and Megan and and Ch Cheyenne and just everybody, John Attic, uh, all the good people that I'll be working with out in uh, well UFC three hundred this weekend. It's we're, a big we'll one. We'll be calling those fights. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna do a little analyzing um, ahead of time of the preview of the couple of the fights later in the show. We'll, we'll do a preview of a couple of those great fights, but it's a loaded card. I, it, It's not just that I'll be out there uh, with ESPN being able to call some great or analyze some great fighters' fights, but I'll be around uh, great people. I'll be with championship people, with the people I just mentioned. Uh, work with for me that's that's the real pleasure that's the real gift that i'm that i'm around good people and then of course tonight uh you guys will you will already know tomorrow because this show is monday but it'll be it'll be up tomorrow on tuesday and the national championship game tonight with the men's college basketball game uh purdue uconn UConn looking to repeat. They got the right. They got the right two teams, Ken. Yeah, they've been the two outstanding teams during the tournament, and they were the two top teams consistently all year long. Purdue and UConn, and it's a very interesting match. Kind of like corner fight, you know, where there's a lot of interesting um, comparisons. You got the two best big men right in the center, right in the paint. Uh, the two best big men in the game. Uh, one with UConn. One with Purdue, uh, they're going to go head-to-head. -head. Uh, it's got a lot to do with it. I think at the end of the day, 
it's probably I, I favor UConn. Obviously, most people you know that have been watching the show know that I talked to them before the season started. Did, did some motivational speaking when Dan Hurley called me up uh, last year, two years ago now, uh, before last year's championship season even started, and then again after they won the championship, which they weren't expected to last year, um, then they he asked me to talk to him again before the beginning of this year. Uh, when they were the, now the defending champions and are the favorites to win it, and I, I, I think they'll win it. You know, obviously, but uh, it, it'll be a really interesting game, competitive game. I think the difference. Both have the great big men in the middle. I think the difference is that UConn has other supporting cast around them. That's that's better. Uh, I, I they got the three point shooters. So does Purdue, but they have the the shooters on the outside. They have the guys that that can break down the defense inside and outside. Uh, they got they 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 play good defense. Purdue played tremendous defense in their last game um, and in a couple games actually in this tournament uh, showed really good defense. But uh, UConn plays really good defense, really good offense. They mix it up. Uh, like I said, they I think they have... I, I think the other parts are a little better, but I think where they separate themselves even more is they have more role players where it could come in in a spot where we, we need a outside shot. We need somebody to drive to the paint and go to the foul line, whatever it is. Uh, we need somebody to, you know, step it up on defense. They have more of those role players, and their bench is deeper. And I think at the end of the day, that that might be the difference with UConn winning the national title. I got to ask Rob if he's get my bookie uh, <laughs> to do something here with me uh, picking the games. There's a lot of fans out there who would probably say I'm picking the games better than I'm picking the fights. So I'm, I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure that you know, I'm sure the fans are very appreciative that I'm giving them basketball scores to supplement, supplement the boxing, not scores, but uh, basketball uh, analysis and picks. Uh, to supplement the boxing picks. I'm sure that they're very thrilled uh, with that. And then I guess the final thing, I want to, I, I just want to send up, I, I, I want to say two quick things. One is when I was driving back, I had to take a, I had to take an Uber today because my wife is babysitting down in Jersey for my daughter and our beautiful grandchildren down there. <laughs> and so she called me a, an Uber, of course, everyone knows I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm useless. Other than knowing something about fighting in life, I'm useless. I, I'm technology deprived, uh, depraved, everything. And I don't even know how to call an Uber. So she got me an Uber. And going there and coming home. So coming home, I, one of those nice surprises of, that makes your day a little better. I have a Pakistanian driver. We, we start talking and we get into a talk about our kids. <laughs> He's got two young kids. He's got a daughter getting ready to go to college. <laughs> he wants her to stay here. She, she's, um, she's looking to go to Rochester for college. Uh, but he's hoping she gets accepted into either NYU or Columbia, which would, of course, be, you know, their, their top academic schools. <laughs> uh, so, and, and I'm talking about my grandkids, my kids, and... What I want to say is just what I've touched on before when we always use this this platform to connect the dots to people, to life, uh, the fight that they fight. I, I got reminded once again, I did when I went to Saudi Arabia the last two times, especially the last time when I got hurt, and I saw the compassion of the people over there, different people from a different culture, from a different part of the world, <laughs> um, treat me the way they did. And the kids over there that in the gym where I was teaching them, uh, when they asked me to give a class, just seeing the respect, uh, the just the, the care about people, the respect for other people that obviously they were taught by their parents. And I, it reminded me of how 
we can think all we want about how different we look, how different we are, how separated our cultures might be, how far away geograph- you know, geography-wise we are from each other, how our language is different, our religions are different, all of that, all of it. But our hearts, our souls, our spirits, if, if they are of a good place, a good way of thinking. And look, I, I get it. There's people out there that don't care as much about being good as some do. But the majority of people do. They really do. And when you get down to it, there is no difference. All the things I just mentioned, creed, culture, you know, religion, race, ethnicity, all of that, but what really matters is the core of just the core of your of your being. Just just the core of your humanity. And when you get down to it, all people that care about the right things are basically the same. They care about they care about people. They care beyond themselves. They they want to live a good life, but they're able to go outside their own sphere and be able to care about what's around them, what's outside them, because they know that that will add to their life, that will add to everyone's life, that will add basically to to the world that they that they have to be part of, that we are the same in that way. Most decent people want the world to be better. They want to live in harmony. They, they want their neighbor to be okay. They don't wish harm or ill on others because they're different. And I just got, a, I got another reminder of that. A guy from Pakistan, his wife is from Tunisia, and, you know, as far separated from my culture and my upbringing as you could be. Yet, by the end of the car ride, I felt like we were brothers. <laughs> I, I can't say it's simpler. I can't say it's truer. Um, I just felt that way. And it's just a reminder, again, that sometimes we got to give ourselves a chance to see people beyond how we see them or how we imagine them or how we preordain them. We have to see them for what they are. And give them a chance to show what they are. So anyway, I wanted to. I I just wanted to say that real quick. And I also I got a text from Keith Sullivan, one of my dear friends, one of the people that helped me with my foundation, the charity foundation we run for the last twenty eight years, and to help people. He's one of the lawyers that does the pro bono work, along with David Berlin, along with my daughter Nicole, along with Pedro Martinez, who's just great, um, along with Dan Donovan, uh, all these people. And the same people that are trying to put together a national commission, a national boxing commission to help the sport, to help, to, to help all of us, to have a cleaner, better sport, and most of all, to help the fighters. And he gave me a call, or he gave me a text, actually, just letting me know, and I want to take this moment to send prayers out. He let me know there's, there's a league. There's a league. I don't know if everyone's aware of it. It's called the Team Combat League. It's a league where they they fight one-round fights, round-robin style in a tournament. It's Again, it's called TCL, Team Combat League. One round, they, they just fight one round, and, and they get paid pretty good. They, get, they fight one-round fights, uh, round-robin in a tournament, and a fighter named Artie Nedembo, uh, N-D-E-M-B-O, Nedembo, he was 8-0 going into the fight, he got knocked out in one round, it's a one round fight, but he, tragically, he's now in a medically induced coma, and that's why we fight so hard for a national commission. That's why I get so freaking bent out of shape 
that I get you people twisted sometimes when I used to be doing the commentating on ESPN and I would get crazy when they robbed a fighter. And I still get crazy. I get crazy over here. I make Ken crazy. I make everyone crazy Well, when, <laughs> when somebody gets robbed in our sport. That's why. Because I always am aware of what the risk is, as the fighters are. And so when I see a fighter robbed, I'm like I, I look at the I, I, I look at the, the refs or the judges and say, How dare you? How dare you, you son of a you know what? How dare you rob this kid when he's risking what he's risking? How dare you? So anyway, I um this kid, Artie Nembo, he's Let's say a prayer for him. That's all. I just want to send out that we're... I'm glad Keith let me know about it. I just want to send out our well wishes and, again, prayers that he will um, he will recover. He will recover. So let's start doing the fights now and take it away. Yeah. The line, by the way, the line on that UConn game tonight, Huskies minus three, even money. And money line is minus 210 on the Huskies, plus 155 on the Boilermakers, over under 76 and a half. There hasn't been one game that UConn has played in last year's tournament, which they won, or this year's tournament, which, of course, they're one game away from winning, that has not been in the double figures. They've won every game by double figures, every game. It kind of reminds me when Mike Tyson, when I was training Mike Tyson, and um, he was 15 years old, and he won the 14, 15 years old, both ages, right? And he won the National Junior Olympics in Colorado uh, two years in a row, which, you know, that's significant. But what really made it significant, he won two years in a row all by one round knockouts. And... That's that that makes it kind of puts you on a different, you know, puts you in a different place, and that's where UConn is right now, where they're in a different place. They've winning everything by double figures. Now, Purdue, I think, has won every game in this tournament by double figures. I think they have. Uh, I'm pretty sure they have. So again, very even, maybe match up they got a three points very 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 interesting matchup um is this the is this the one game where UConn actually gets their feet held to the fire a little bit and they don't win by double figures uh, maybe but I'm you know I'm gonna go where I've been you know the last two years saying UConn's gonna win gonna win it again gonna repeat you know, um, so I, I'll go with that. And uh, I guess I would go with the money line, too, if I didn't want to lay the three. If I thought it was going to be a close game, I would go with the money, lay, uh, lay the 210, right? The minus 210 to win 100. Yep. Uh, but at least I don't have to give up points. So I might be, yeah. you know, I might be swayed to go that way. It's going to be a high-scoring game, 76 and a half. Yeah, I, you know... These teams can play defense too. Yeah, I'm going to say it's going to be high scoring, yeah. But these teams can play defense too. Uh, you know, I just said it. Purdue, Purdue just played great defense in the semifinal game, uh, you know, to get here. So uh, I, they, they, they can, defense wins championships, they used to always say in football. So when yep. push comes to shove, you usually wind up going to your defense. Defense wins championships in boxing usually. Quite often, the guy with the better defense beats the guy with the better offense or, or with the comparable offense. Whoever has the better defense is going to be the better fighter usually inside that squared circle. So defense, very important. But both these teams are, are high-powered. They got the they got the guys that can shoot it from the outside. As we said, they got the guys in the paint. Um, what's the under over again? Seventy six and a half. I'm talking defense. I better stick with defense. All right, I'll go under. 
<laughs> there it is. Thanks to our friends at My Bookie. We'll be back with some My Bookie um, lines on the UFC 300 as we go down the uh, preview show there. But let's get into boxing. Uh, super middleweight Diego Pacheco beats Sean McCallman. McCallman, uh, exciting fight. Um, I'm dying to hear what you think of this. <laughs> no one cares about my opinion on this. I want to hear what you thought. I thought it was an exciting fight. Yeah, listen, it was anticipation there. Or maybe the anticipation was more exciting than the actual yeah, fight, I, but I enjoyed the... I thought it devolved a little bit into a little bit of an ugly fight where... Yeah, that's fair. McCollum, the underdog, big underdog. They were both undefeated. Pacheco 21-0, I think McCollum... Oh, at least he's twenty one and zero now. I guess he was twenty one, twenty and zero going in. Yep. And McCollum fifteen and zero going in. Super middleweights on on the zone. I thought that McCollum was surprising, and he was surprising people early on, being a big underdog hanging in there. But the way he did it was with a very awkward, unexciting style that. He didn't throw much, so you couldn't hit him much. You could, Pacheco, who's a knockout artist, couldn't catch him. He's a wiry guy, like a lot of good punches, like a Bob Foster, the, the former light heavyweight champion years ago, back in the 50s, 60s, whatever that was. Foster was t like a long drink of water. He, he was a tall, skinny guy, and he could punch. And most of those wiry guys that I always would talk about, they get good leverage, they can punch. Pacheco's like that. He wasn't, you can't hit something if something's not really giving you a chance to hit it by being, you know, by being competitive or by being uh, aggressive. It's harder to catch a guy when he's fighting partly to win, partly to survive. And as the fight went on, McCollum fought more to survive as it got late. But early on, it was interesting. You're right. Because McCollum was, he was looking to, he was looking to time Pacheco. He realized he couldn't go just be aggressive because Pacheco is too tall. He knows how to fight tall. Pacheco would counter him coming in, would, would make him pay a price. So McCollum tried to play it smart, and and his co corner was ready to play it smart and disciplined, not to give him anything to counter, not to just walk into a big shot, be very conservative, be very buttoned up, be very careful, look to time the bigger guy, maybe catch him coming in, get see if you could in, induce him to to reach a little bit, uh, and, and you could catch him or time him with shots or catch him going out, which McCollum did once in a while with the left hook. Uh, you know, so early on, he made it, interesting again because he's the underdog and are we seeing an upset you start to wonder you know you start to think about that a little bit so early on it was you know it was interesting but exciting no because of the styles I just described because if McCollum fought exciting he probably would have got knocked out so he was again he was being very cautious very careful being smart trying to give himself a chance to get into the fight, to win the fight. Uh, as it went on, Pacheco, I thought, I thought the commentators got caught up in something that you can get caught up in. They were watching a fight where the big favorite, Pacheco, the guy who's expected to win and win big, is not winning big. I don't know if he's losing, but he's definitely not winning big. And when you're watching a fight where you put in your head that one guy's supposed to win and he's not dominating, he's not winning the way you envisioned him to, you can sometimes get caught up in a little bit of an enigma, sort of, where you start to think he's losing, even though he's not losing. Because he's not winning big. He's not doing what we expect him to do. So you start to think, well, if he's not doing what we thought he was doing, he must be losing. If he's not dominating, he must be losing. If he's not way ahead, he must be behind. And I think that there's a phenomenon to that where you start to get caught up in that. And I thought the commentators did. They had... At least one of them. They had McCollum uh, winning the fight. And then finally, 
not until really late in the fight that I think they got it right where they finally had Pacheco winning. Because I, it was close early, but then I saw Pacheco winning rounds because he was making a fight, he was pushing a fight, he was taking more chances, <laughs> he was showing a nice adjustment when he wasn't leading in a stupid way where he would have walked into McCollum's, what McCollum wanted, which was for him to give up his height and to walk in and get counted. Um, but he was pressing a fight. He was he was being the aggressive. He was doing it behind the jab. He was, you know, he was still cognizant of being, you know, responsible defensively and, like I said, not walking into a trap with the shorter guy. But he also mixed up some countering. When when McCollum tried to come at him, he counted. Uh, Pacheco's the kind of guy that knows how to fight tall. He can dominate you on the outside. But he also showed that he can fight inside. He threw some nice short punches inside. He did some nice work. on. He actually, he was beating McCollum on the inside, which was really where McCollum had to win if he was going to win the fight. And Pacheco, at the end of the day, was winning the fight outside and inside. <laughs> and I just thought that it took the commentators a while to realize Hey, Pacheco's winning this fight. They they had him behind early, and then they had it even late. And then finally, I can't remember what round it was, but finally late later in the fight, they they finally had um they finally put Pacheco ahead, which I thought he was already ahead. And and I thought he was pretty well ahead. So obviously they, they saw it closer than I did. I saw Pacheco eventually just taking charge of the fight, being a boss, being more aggressive, uh, being more versatile inside and outside, just being busier. Um, you know, being the guy that carried the fight. Fifth round uh, to the uh, went to Pacheco. I made a note to myself. Commentators, uh, like I said, were caught up favoring McCollum because as the underdog, he was hanging in there. But I thought Pacheco was winning the rounds just doing more than McCollum. Uh, after four rounds, one commentator had it 39-37 for McCollum. I had Pacheco, as I said, ahead. I didn't have him behind in the fight, um, even though I thought earlier it was closer than it it, it, it it got further apart later. Uh, so I thought Pacheco just carried rounds, being busier uh, as the fight went on. I'm just looking at my notes. Uh, I thought McCollum did... I I meant to say I thought Pacheco, if I made a mistake there, Pacheco was, you know, just pushing a fight, being a boss. Uh, McCollum did a lot of clinching and holding. Uh, I I thought it took a while for the commentators to really remark that McCollum was grabbing too much. Yeah, uh, it was. I think it was the ninth round where finally they said something, and I just took. I just took. Thought it took a while for them to notice that McCollum had been doing that for quite a while. Uh, the yep. tenth round, the commentator finally had Pacheco ahead going into the tenth, which, like I said, I I had him ahead uh, earlier than that. Um, uh, I, I thought McCollum did more holding than punching, probably the last four or five rounds. Uh, more surviving than winning. But uh, ugly, hard-fought win for Pacheco, who at the end of the day methodically wore down McCollum, I thought. Uh, I thought he won handily and clearly. Uh, the scores were 98-92, 97-93, 96-94, 94, unanimous decision. I was I was closer to the 98-92 than than the 96-94. I'm with you. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I agree. I, I, I agreed with the bigger scores. Um, Pacheco needs a little more time. Uh, time. I think he needs more seasoning, uh, more physical maturity. Uh, he's only 23 years old. I, I think they got to give him time before they think about him being ready for any of the top 168 pounders in that division. I like him, but he ain't ready for prime time uh, with, yep. with some of those guys. That happened to be there. What's next? What do we got next there? All right. Next, we got the hotly contested Richard Richard Hitchens unanimous decision over Gustavo Lemos. I thought Lemos won the fight. Um, 
This one is getting a lot of attention online. Scorecards, 117, 111, and two, two of them scored at 15, 13, but 117, 111. I would just love an explanation as to how he scored it like that because I didn't see that one-sided fight that he saw. That was um, that was from Tim Cheatham. Um, appropriate name. But I'm appropriate name. On- <laughs> no, no, really. It's I, I have enough for Cheatham trying I to agree. cheat. I, I have enough for Cheatham I cheating them. I, I have enough... I have enough. He's done too much cheating or whatever you want to call it. Call it bad scoring. Whatever you want to call it. Enough is enough. Enough is enough. Yep. I mean, uh, that that was that was criminal that score. I mean, whoever you liked, I don't care who you liked. It was a close fight. It was a close fight. Yeah, that's what I wanted to know. I was questioning my sanity because I was like, what no, no, the hell? it was How close. Can you possibly be this far I off. I would do. I thought Lemos pulled it out. But either way, I thought he won it down the stretch. I thought I thought he won the early rounds. If you didn't have him up the first two rounds, two nothing, then then that's the sign that you're looking to fix the fight. No, really, I'm strong with it. I don't care. Yep. If you don't have him winning those first two rounds, Lemos, he did all the work, all the punching, everything the first two rounds. Then if you don't have him win, then you're you're setting up a fixed fight. And if you don't have him winning the twelfth, and cheat him, I don't know about the other judges, but cheat him didn't give him the twelfth. I mean, are you kidding me? Lemos went after the twelfth. <laughs> he went after it in a hungry way. He's the big underdog. He went after it. He won that round. The middle rounds, Hitchens steadied the ship. It was taking on a lot of water to ship. He steadied the ship in the middle rounds. He started placing a cleaner, accurate punch. Look, no doubt about it. Lemos drew more, but Lemos was just throwing sometimes where Hitchens was placing more accurate punches, better place punches, uh, cleaner punches. No doubt about it. He did that in the middle rounds. But then in the late rounds and the early rounds, Lemos just outworked him and hurt him. Now, Hitchens hurt Lemos late with a nice body shot, but Lemos hurt Lemos hurt Hitchens a couple times, especially late. That's right. Um, catching him, pulling out. Uh, stepping with him with with big shots and catching him, you know, pulling straight back. And and they both went to the body, did some nice body work. <laughs> I just thought that Lemos won enough rounds to to get that to get the win. Look, full disclosure, my charity foundation, the Doctor Atlas Foundation. A lot of people know, some don't know. It don't matter. What matters is what we did. We we. We subsidized, funded three gyms for 10 years. One in Brooklyn, two in Staten Island. One of them was already existing. A guy named Russo had come to me, and he used to run the PAL. The PAL had pulled out funding in the gym, so the kids had no gyms to go to anymore. And he asked me if I would subsidize the gyms. At the end of the day, I did. We actually created, built, with the help of people like Dan Donovan, uh, uh, actually, uh, Mike Cusick was the big guy on Staten Island. Donovan, too. He helped us, too. But Mike Cusick, the councilman, tremendous man, tremendous man. Um, real politi- not Put it this way, not a real politician. A real civil servant who understands who he works for, the people, not for himself. He helped us get one of the ho- gyms in the Berry Houses that didn't exist. We also built a gym in East Flatbush, Brooklyn, that didn't exist at the time until the foundation came along and put it up. Like I said, Russo asked me if I would get involved and do this. We did. We did it for 10 years. The other gym, uh, Park Hill Gym, that had been open for years, but it was closed down because of the, the, as I just said, the funding being pulled from the PAL. We reopened it. We subsidized it for 10 years, and then I, then I stopped. And it's still existing, still doing, you know, still, still forming fighters, still being a, a place for kids to, to go and get away from the streets, get away from the violence of the streets, become better people, and obviously have a chance to become fighters too. I was doing it for one reason, to make them better people. But it turned out that they also became good fighters. And one of the kids that came out of there was Hitchens. I remember working with him when he was, I don't know, 11, 12 years old. We, we had the trainers in there that we paid. Um, but I would come in and I would give tips and I would, 
you know, just oversee, make sure the kids were going to school, they were doing the things that I thought were the most important. Go to school, uh, you know, stay stay out of trouble, you know, and, um, you know, just, just, just try to be better people. And so I remember when he was about 12 years old, one of the things that I, that I remember telling him was, you got to learn. He he's tall and he's he's lean and he's got a long long reach. You got to throw the jab from the right distance. I remember at the beginning, every once in a while he'd throw the jab because you could see he was a smart kid. He was a deliberate kid. He was going to be that kind of fighter where he was going to be thoughtful. He was going to be cautious. He was going to be you know he's going to be smart, and the jab was going to be a big part of that. So I remember early on in the gym telling him. You you got to throw your jab with full extension. You got great physical assets with this length, but you got to use it. You got to fully extend that jab. You throw it from too close, you're going to let the shorter guys counter you with right hands. So I remember how he worked on that, worked on that. And obviously he became, not because of me, because of himself and because of help with with obviously those the trainers that were there day to day working with him, not like me just in spots. But he got it down where that became the, the strength of his game, the jab. And the jab from the right distance, control and range. And that stayed with him. And to this day, that's his game. His, his game is, and, and you know, the funny thing was, I, I just want to say this, was when, when we started funding the gyms, I was going to call it just the Dr. Atlas Foundation gyms. But, but Russo who obviously, as I said, he used to run a PAL. Uh, he's a former cop, and he wanted it to be the Cops and Kids. So we merged the two names. We merged Dr. Atlas, Cops and Kids. It could have been just Dr. Atlas, which, you know, we were we were the ones funding it. But I thought, no, no, that's that's fair. That was That's the name he wanted. That's the name he used to uh, use. Fine. Uh, we'll, we'll do Dr. Atlas, Cops and Kids. And it was funny because one of the commentators, I'm trying to remember which one it was. Um, who the heck was it? It was, uh, it was uh, the commentator who's the writer. Um, uh, Kriegel? No, no, no. That's ESPN. This was oh, The sorry. Zone. Chris Mannix. Yeah, Mannix. He used to write for sports. So I guess he still does. That's right. Does a good job. But it was funny. He was talking about Russo having started those gyms and and that that this kid Hitchens came out of them, you know, the cops and kids gyms. He 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 left off the Dr. Atlas that he came out of the Dr. Atlas Cops and Kids gym. At least then. Now it's no longer it's just cops and kids. But at the beginning he left that out. And um obviously uh he didn't do it in a in a you know, purposely, he, he just, I guess he, that's the information he got. That was the cops and kids gyms. But as I said, the genesis of it was, it was uh, the the foundation. We were blessed enough, privileged enough, fortunate enough to be able to help out a little bit, which at the end of the day, helped get a little, a lot of kids off the streets, a lot of kids through school, helped them get from point A to point B, get through school, get through tough parts in there, and a lot of the kids wound up being fighters. But when you run programs like that, the majority are not going to be fighters. You just hope the majority of them become better people. And and I'll finish you with the one thing that I felt that the foundation got out of this, the one big thing for for all the you know funding that we did for all those years. The most important thing, yeah, there's been some champions, a lot of uh, Golden Glove champions, a lot of national champions, a few world champions that came out of there, but and a couple Olympics uh, Olympians came out of there. But the most important thing was better people came out of there. And there's one I'm thinking about. I think about all the time. It was a girl that was living in her car in Brooklyn with her mother at the time, and she went to the gym. And after a couple of years in the gym. She got through high school. She got through what she had to get through. She improved. Because part of our program was that the foundation hired a certified teacher to be there five days a week. 
Uh, and we had a tiny little computer room where the kids had to go in there. That was part of the rules. And they had to get tutoring one day a week. And this girl who had been living in a car with her mom, she wound up going to the United States Navy. That, to me, that was worth everything. That was, that was worth every cent, every, every minute, every resource that we put into that gym. That made it worthwhile. Uh, but getting, because there's some things that are more important than just becoming a champion fighter. Like winning your fight in life. And she won her fight in life. So Hitchens, uh, he's 17 and 0, I guess, going in. Lemos was 29 and 0. Really nice, nice matchup. The fight got a little hairy where when Hitchens was a little too defensive, Lemos was winning those rounds. Um, I thought neither guy's a big puncher. And I tell you, Hitchens is probably both of them are. They're both fortunate neither one was a big puncher. And Hitchens is fortunate too. Because if Lemos was a bigger puncher, Hitchens would have had a larger problem than just a really tough fight. Which he had a really tough fight. They both did. Hitchens was... He gave away the first couple rounds just being defensive. Lemos just outworked him. (laughs) I don't know how you couldn't give the first two rounds to to Lemos. Well, they did. (laughs) They didn't give him all. That's crazy. That shows you what they were looking to do. It does. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, There's no excuse for that. The middle rounds, Hitchens took over. Two of them had Hitchens. Two of them had Hitchens winning the first round. Yeah, the cheating guy, or che- the Which guy who was cheating. I'm sure he did too. He's got a very appropriate name. Cheatham and Steve Weisfeld both had Hitchens winning the first round, which is insane. When you break it down round by round, that it like that, it's really easy to understand what's going on. The house fighter gets the benefit of a decision again. Um, we need a national commission. We really do. We need a national commission. We're trying to get one. Please sign the petition, uh, people out there. If you agree with me, if you want to see a national commission, try to get rid of some of this nonsense that's destroying the game, to destroying fighters' careers. <laughs> but Hitchens wins the middle rounds. <laughs> and he showed heart. Lemo showed heart. Uh, Hitchens pulled out a late round when he had to. But the last round was Lemo's. Uh, Lemos was coming on strong for most of the later part of the fight. Uh, Hitchens was Hitchens a very cautionary fighter, very defensive oriented. Um, you know, he he looks to counter, he looks to control. He wants to make his living on the outside. When you get close, for the most part, he grabs, he clinches. He, I thought he got a big benefit from. Not only the judges, I thought he got a benefit. And and listen, I'm talking about a kid that came from the gyms that we started. But again, I pride myself in saying what I believe is the truth, not induced by anything else, not influenced by anything else, anything else. And I think too many people on TV nowadays go along with an agenda. They, they go along to get along. They want someone to like them. They want to keep their jobs, whatever it is. And instead of just saying what I think, needs to be said and what maybe they know should be said but they don't say it i give credit to these commentators they did say in this fight especially sergio mora i the former champion that's right i who i called a lot of his fights on espn i give him all the credit in the world he said that late in the fight, he said that he thought the fight was getting away from Hitchens, that Lemos was just taking control of the fight, the rhythm of the fight. Um, I thought he was right. He, he said this fight's getting away from Hitchens. Then he said that he thought, actually they all said that they thought Hitchens lost, that Lemos won a fight. Sergio said, I thought he lost the fight. Um, everybody, everybody agreed. What I was disappointed in was that afterwards, when the scores came out and they gave it to Hitchens, that some of the commentators, um, I, I think, I think, uh, I think even more so, the one I was just talking about um, uh, from from Sports Illustrated, uh, Chris Mannix. Yeah, I think Mannix. I think Mannix. 
went back a little bit. I was a little disappointed. He 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 agreed with Sergio, and everybody said, "Yeah, I thought Lemos won." Then after the scores come out, he says, "Well, you can't argue with a what was it, one fifteen, one thirteen? You know, one of the one of the close scores. You can't argue with a one." I want to make sure that was right, right? 115, 113? That's right. Two of them had a 15, 13, and the other one was 17, 11. He backpedals. He says, well, you can't argue with a 115, 113 score. I can't argue with that. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Five minutes earlier, two minutes earlier, you said he lost. He either lost or he <laughs> won. There, there's no all of a sudden saying you can't argue with a 115, 113. Wait, I, I'm, again, I'm, I'm getting crazy here. How can you say, after you agreed that he lost, turn around and say, well, you know, I don't agree with the 117, 111, which nobody did, thank God, but the 115, 113, I, I can't go against that. I, I can't disagree. I, I don't have a problem with that. So now you're saying that you don't have a problem that you thought Hitchens won. 115, 113 win. Either somebody won or they lost. It doesn't matter if it's one point or two points or three points. It doesn't matter. If if you thought that Hitchens lost, which you said three minutes earlier that he lost, how can you turn around and say, I don't have a problem with Hitchens now winning by 115, 113? It can't go both ways. Again, 1.2 points, 115, 113, 112, 113, whatever it is, you win or you lose. You got to get consistent, guys. You got because you're going to lose your integrity. You're going to lose your, your you're going to you're going to lose your reputation. You you're going to you you're no longer and that's the risk the sport of boxing has where it loses its credibility. It loses its credibility with this bad judging and this bad refereeing, where a house fight is always on the on the favored side. You you don't have credibility after a while. As a commentator, you're gonna lose your credibility if you flip flop like that. You can't do that. And and one other thing, I gotta say something about. She's a great fighter, one of the greatest women fighters of all time. I caught her fights in the Olympics, her first fights when she was only 16 years old. Matter of fact. When I did the Olympics, I remember saying that nobody was going to medal on the men's team uh, or either not going to medal or we we weren't going to win a gold medal. The only place we were going to win a gold medal was the women's team, Clarissa Shields. And sure enough, she made me look smart. She won the gold medal at 16. She, She was a great amateur, great champion, professional fighter, one of the greatest women fighters ever. But you can't be paid as a commentator, Clarissa, and openly cheer for one of the fighters. You got to be non-biased or at least look non-biased. And look, I've been in a position where I could be tested that way, where you don't think I ever caught a fight where there was someone I liked that I knew that I liked better than the other guy, that, that I wouldn't have minded <laughs> as a human being. We're human, seeing him win, but I did not let that leak into my commentating, into my broadcast. I did not. I could not. I would not be a professional. If I did that, I, I, I'd have to resign. I, I might have got fired, so I wouldn't have to resign. But I would have to resign and say I can't be a commentator if I'm going to be biased like that. I, I have to call it for what it is in a cold way, in a non-biased way. You can't root for one of the fighters when you're the commentator. When you have that co- responsibility of being a commentator, of telling the audience from a professional standpoint what is going on and what you think is going on, you cannot cheer openly as she did for Hitchens. I mean, there were rounds when she started saying, get off the ropes, go to the body, come on, come on, let's go. I mean, when you do that, really, when you do that, you have to just put the microphone down, say, thank you, I'm sorry, I can't do this anymore. And, and then you got to go and sit at the, sit, either sit in a seat and cheer all you want or get a job training a guy. Get a job training him and, and, and yelling in his corner, telling him, talking to him in his corner, be an advisor. But you cannot be a, a broadcaster and behave that way. 
You can't do that. And she did it. And and I'll give credit. I'll give credit to Todd Grissom, you know, uh, another one of the commentators who openly said, you're, you can't shift. I, I'm trying to remember exactly what, sh- what he said, but he basically said, y- y- you're supposed to be non-biased. You, you're cheering for, you're cheering for, for Hitchens. You, you, you're supposed, you're not supposed to be biased. He actually said that on the air. And I give him credit for saying that. So, and again, as, as I said, I, I give, I give, uh, I give Mannix, all of them credit for having the right saying initially who won, who I thought won also, who I guess a lot of people thought won, but I was just disappointed that he didn't stick to his guns, that that he went a little bit backwards. And look, I know who they work for. They work for the network, and the network is tied in with the promoter. So uh, I, I, they're not dumb. They know what the promoter and what the network want to hear for the most part. But again, I, I would say you work for the fans. The network without the fans ain't going to put a product out there no more. If the fans stop going, the network ain't going to be paying you no more because there's going to be no reason to pay you because there's going to be nobody watching. So at the end of the day, you owe it to yourself and you owe it to the fans to call it straight, to call it honest, to call it in a non-biased way. And if you say something like Maddox, who's a you know does a really good job, but if you say something like, "Yeah, I agree, he he lost," you can't go back four minutes later and say, "Yeah, the one fifteen, one thirteen, uh, is a good score." When when you just finished saying that guy lost, you, you, it's just not consistent. We have to have consistency here. But at the end of the day. Hitchens showed what he is right now. He's an incomplete project. He's still a work in progress. He definitely needs more maturing physically, mentally. Uh, I think this fight will help him in that way. (laughs) But he needs to continue to grow. He is not ready for guys like Mattias, um, one of the top guys, one of the champions in that division. Uh, Mattias, uh, Haney. Uh, Tank Davis, who's coming up maybe, uh, who might come up and wait. Um, you know, Teofimo Lopez, he, he's just not ready. I'm not saying he won't be ready, but you, you, you know, I would not, I would not put him, forget about the same ring, I wouldn't put him in the same room with those guys. <laughs> not now. He, he might be, he might be, he thinks he is, fine. Fighters supposed to think that. But the managers, they better think a little different. Yeah, they they better think with this, not with this, not with the heart, with the head. Uh, he needs more time. He'll get more time probably. Uh, and right now, he uh, he's a work in progress. He he got he got a valuable lesson if he takes it the right way. He he got a valuable gift if he if he cherishes it and appreciates it the right way. Um, and looks at not just what he did good, but what he did wrong, and and is honest with himself, yeah. honest enough to be able to look at himself in a way where he can go and fix what has to be fixed, not just think because he got the win that there's nothing to fix or that you know he's the greatest thing since uh, sliced bread, which a lot of kids start thinking because they got sometimes they got too many. They they got too many cheerleaders around them that that are more concerned about staying around them, keeping their job, you know, uh, feeding them, feeding their ego, telling them champ, 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 you're you're the best champ, you're the best champ, and then all of a sudden, one day, they're not the best. One day they got a problem. One day they're in tears. One one day they got a a, a big lesson taught to them, and they got to wonder. Why didn't you tell me these things earlier? Because maybe I could have done something if you weren't just cheerleading me. Maybe I could have corrected some of these things. That's right. You know, the great story is Joe Namath, the great, great football player who was doing Monday Night Football. And after every show, he he would ask the, the directors and the people around them, you know, they all wanted to be friends with him. He would ask them, how am I doing? Great, Joe. How am I doing? Great, Joe. How am I doing? Great, Joe. 
And then when he got fired, <laughs> somebody asked him, how come you got fired, Joe? He said, because I was great. <laughs> so, so if you're really yeah, well. friends and really a trainer, you got to tell these kids the truth. So Hitchens again, Hitchens, he's going to make his living on the outside. He's got a good jab. He's an accurate puncher. He's defensively knows what he's doing. Um, he's got to learn. He's got to learn to be consistent. He's got too many gaps where he goes defensive too long, where Lemos was able to take control of the fight, control of the pace, the rhythm of the fight, the tempo of the fight. If he does that with the big boys, he's going to have a problem. You can't have those moments where you shut the engine off. You can't do that, where, where you just shut down offensively and allow the other guy to go on full offensive mode with nothing to worry about. You can't do that. He's got to learn to be able to sustain offense even when he's in a defensive mode, to still have some semblance, some, some form of offense, some offensive presence when he's on the defense. He has to, and someone has to teach it to him. He has to learn that. But he, um, like I said, I, uh, it's a fight that should help him. It's a fight that I thought he got, you know, he got very fortunate in getting the win the way he got it, but that's not important. The important is what did he or didn't he learn and what will he improve coming out of this fight? Uh I've, I've, I'll just finish by saying the reason I thought Lemos won, which I guess I, hopefully I broke it down clear enough, but uh, the, re the reason I thought he won was he was just, he, I'm not saying he was more accurate than Hitchens. Hitchens throws the cleaner, more accurate punches, um, the better place punches, but Lemos was just not only busier, he hurt him in a couple of spots, uh, took control of some rounds in a way that I thought it carried the fight for him. No doubt that Hitchens won those middle rounds, really did steady the ship, did take control, did have his moments. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, a controversial fight. Uh, I, 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 as much as the judges, I thought, obviously favored Hitchens, the house fighter, can, can anyone argue that the referee favored Hitchens by never warning him for holding. I mean, he held yeah. an inordinate amount of time during the fight. He held. He just, he held, he held, he grabbed, he clinched. Okay, he did what he felt he had to do on the inside with a guy who was looking to, to win the fight on the inside. Yeah. But he held so much. It made for an ugly fight, and he never... Forget about it. he never got a point taken away by the... Usually you see a point taken away in that kind of situation or scenario. But he never got warned. I mean, when you think about it, he never got warned one time for holding. Not once. And any cockamamie fan out there that thinks that I'm being this or that or... No, I'm being honest. I'm being honest. Right down the middle on both sides. You... That kind of fight, if you're a referee, like I said, Cheatham, Cheatham should lose his right to be a judge. That referee should really lose his right to be a referee. You don't yeah. warn the guy. Forget yeah. about taking points away. You don't warn him. Yeah, yeah, crazy. Like you said, hopefully he learns a lesson from this one and the fight will end up being good experience for Hitchens. But uh, interesting to see where he goes next. Um, Teddy, before we jump into the UFC, want to give a quick shout out to our friends over at Athletic Greens. Athletic Greens is the all-in-one green drink. You take it in the morning every day. I take it. Teddy takes it. Even if you're eating the healthiest diet, it's easy to, it's easy to miss some of the micronutrients that are included in Athletic Greens. Athletic Greens made from 75 
75 whole food sourced ingredients. Like I say, one scoop in the morning, and that's your insurance policy for your body's health and immunity every day. For listeners of this show, if you go to athleticgreens.com slash atlas, again, promo code atlas, they'll give you 10 free travel packs with your first purchase. The travel packs are invaluable. I'm going up to do some stuff this weekend around the Boston Marathon because I'll be traveling and busy during the weekend. I'm not running. I'm just doing some other stuff. I'll take two of those every day, one in the morning and one in the evening. Again, athleticgreens.com slash atlas to take advantage of the 10 free travel packs. Um, want to talk about the UFC big show coming up UFC 300 I two things one I want to again very clearly say to Sergio Mora uh, one of the commentators former champion congratulations really for standing up being honest he actually said that when he heard the 117 111 he said it was a terrible decision a terrible score, and disrespectful to the fighters. Disrespectful. This is a former champion using those words. Disrespectful to the fighters and to the sport. That's what Sergio Moore, I give him credit. I really do. We need a national commission. The one other thing I want to do before we jump into the preview of that, of of the UFC, which is an unbelievable show coming up, my son... Teddy hit me up, and just before we got on the show, let me know that we need to touch real quick on a fight that took place last week that we didn't, you know, we didn't cover it. Um, it was on Peacock app, and it turned out that a lot of people were saying that it could be a candidate for fight of the year. So I felt, I just felt after my son pointed out to me, I felt that we. We have to just real quickly touch on it because sure. um, my son said a lot of people were asking why we didn't touch on it. We can't touch on everything all the time. We're going to miss some. The fight took place in London. That's right. Uh, That's right. It was it was Fabio Wardley, heavyweights. Fab, Fabio Wardley, 17-0, and 0, I believe, uh, with 16 knockouts going in, uh, 29 years old, against... Uh, against Frazier Clark, who's 32 years old, 8-0, I believe, going in. And he was also a bronze medalist in the Olympics, was Frazier Clark. So Frazier Clark was the, had the pedigree amateur-wise, even though he had less pro fights. I, so I, I made sure I watched it. And sure enough, I watched the replay of it where my son told me, and it was a, it was a hell of a fight. It was a hell of a test on what's inside these two guys, not just outside. Uh, Clark, Clark was the the better finesse guy, the 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 more buttoned up technical guy, uh, more solid in in those ways from a technical standpoint. He had more amateur fights, maybe that's why. <laughs> but he, what Wardley might not have had in technique, and his technique wasn't awful. But what he didn't maybe match Frazier in technique, he, or he, he, he made up in pure desire, explosiveness, athleticism, um, and, and just, just throwing punches. Uh, you know, both of them behaved like fighters all night long. Both were tested. Both of them showed great courage. Really, really great courage. I thought at the end of the day, I thought Wardley's will at the end might have been a little stronger although both guys had the heart of an, of the outdoors in them really so I shouldn't even go that way, place I guess but I, I I say it anyway I thought Wardley's will found a way to pull it out a little bit at the end because he got hurt late in the fight they both had been hurt Wardley had Frazier uh, Clark on the floor he actually had him on the floor I think it was the fifth round I'm not sure but he had him on the floor and he also, there was a point taken away from Clark for holding. The referee actually know how to be a ref. He actually took a point away for holding, which, as I said, in the uh, Hitchens-Lemos fight, the referee never even gave a warning for holding. Uh, so he had two points taken away, two potential 10-8 rounds uh, in favor of Wardley. But Clark came back uh, when he had to come back. Uh, 
it was a ebb and flow fight, back and forth. Uh, as I said, Clark is a bit more polished, uh, technically a little more advanced, but um, they both they both not only showed great heart, they they showed great shins, uh, tre- tremendous, just back and forth, back and forth fight. It reminded me a little bit uh, of a fight with George Foreman and Ron Lyle. It was uh, the only difference was in that fight they were both on the floor, back and forth, back and forth. Lyle was on the floor, Foreman was on the floor. This time it was it was only Clark that was on the floor, but it was that kind of fight. A, a real, real, you know, heavyweight struggle and and battle. Uh, at the end of the day, it went the route. the The decision went the way that you might think I'm going with describing the fight. It wound up being a a draw. It was a split draw. I actually thought Wardley won a very close fight, but I sure as hell. Ain't arguing with a draw, because it was yeah. it was that kind of fight. Nobody really deserved to lose the fight. The scores were one fourteen, one thirteen, Wardley, one fifteen, one twelve, Clark, and then it was like I said, a split draw with the one thirteen, one thirteen score making it a draw. Um, I thought Clark grabbed the twelfth round by hurting Wardley, but I felt that Wardley. Uh, what a close fight, like I said. Uh, hard, hard, almost impossible to argue with a draw. There were so many surges back and forth to make it a tr- tremendous fight. Like I said, no one really lost, and nobody did lose. It was the way it should be, I guess, a draw. 11th round, championship rounds. I I made a note to myself, going to tell the story. Uh, both had great chins. Clark threw uh, nice left hooks to the body late in the fight. Uh, I thought Clark tied in eleventh, uh, but uh, but Wardley's uh, pure will to win, uh, you know, really got him out of trouble when he got hurt. Uh, both great heart, as I said. Wardley finished eleventh big, uh, and I thought took that round, twelfth um, round. I, I made a note that you you have to love and enjoy Wardley's energy and will. Uh, Wadley got hurt at the end of the round, but he, you know, he found a way to survive. Uh, I know I enjoyed the fight. Uh, as I said, Wadley's a little bit wide in spots with his punches, but he always finds a way to, you know, suddenly fire big bursts of punches, uh, like a sudden rain shower. Uh, it was, it was a, it was a hell of a fight. Yeah. Uh, a fight worth mentioning for I for the great fans. Nice one. All right. Well, thanks for doing that. Um, let's talk about the preview for the UFC 300 show. Like you said, you're going to be out there in Vegas. It's going to be an exciting one. Let's start with the co-main, Justin Gaethje and Max Holloway battling for the BMF belt on the line. Um, this is a this is a tough fight for both guys. I'm dying to see this one. You can be sure that there'll be a lot of action in this fight. What are you looking for? Yeah, that's listen. Two two guys just great. They all have great heart, but great action, great strikers, well-rounded fighters. Both of them striking all on the mat, but they love to strike. Uh, both have great wills, great chins. I think Max Holloway might have a titanium chin. He might use that alloy that they use in the space shuttle, that you know when you that doesn't disintegrate when you come into the to the Earth's uh, surface. He he's got a chin that's just crazy good. But they they both are durable guys. Uh, I think that Holloway longer a little. I don't know if he's taller, but he's definitely longer. Uh, he uses his jab really well. He boxes on the outside really well using his jab. Uh, Gagey, both of them can kick, but Gagey uses his kicks really well as he did in the Poirier fight. You know, not only to the head, but to the legs where he could take your legs away. I think he's going to have to think about doing that because Max Holloway likes to use those wheels 
on the outside to control the outside with his jab, set the table with the jab, eat with the right hand, pick spots, keep you off balance, give you angles, you know, keep you from getting set. Uh, I think Holloway will look to do that. Gage, he was always the guy that would engage you, uh, be more risky, more risk-taking, where, you know, he'll walk in and make it a, you know, make it a firefight. But in the last couple of fights, he has matured in that way. He has he he has simmered down a little bit. He has gotten uh he he's he's gotten just more contained, uh a, a little bit more patient, more controlled now, which I think makes him a better fighter. And um and he showed that control, he showed that patience in that great fight, that great win with our friend. Dustin Poirier, the great Dustin Poirier. But I think Holloway, for the most part, makes his living on the outside with that jab. I think he's going to look to control the outside with the jab. I think it's going to be incumbent on Gagey to have to then go back to the old Gagey a little bit and start to take more risk and, and push the fight, you know, engage which he used to always do and he's never hesitant to do what he has to that's why the fans love him so much they love both guys because of that um i think gage he's gonna have the burden on his shoulders to have to come forward a little more at some point uh and look to land the power shots look, look to land the counter right hand to take away the jab of holloway at the end of the day i'm gonna have holloway Controlling the outside enough to win enough rounds to win a decision. I don't think either guy gets stopped in this fight. Let me give you the line and see if that uh, changes your opinion. Um, for the, for our friends at my bookie, and you can join my bookie by going to mybookie.ag. You use the promo code Atlas when you make your first deposit, and they'll give you they'll match your first deposit up to a thousand dollars. Again, mybookie.ag. The line on this one, Teddy. Uh, Justin Gaethje minus 190, Max Holloway plus 145, over under four and a half rounds, pretty much even money at four and a half. I like the, I like the over, and I like uh, Holloway. Obviously, I let the cat out of the bag. I I like Holloway to win the decision. Um, again, I love Gaethje. I love them both, but uh, I think Holloway with his legs, the movement, his jab. Obviously, his chin, if he has to absorb something, he can absorb it and survive. I, I think he gets a points decision boxing on the outside uh, as much as he can do that against Gagey. I, I'm going with the underdog. Gotcha. And if I um, if I said this was the co-main, I misspoke. Um, the uh, Zhang Wiley is in, is in the co-main against Yan Janan. Um, and that's a title fight. But Gaethje Holloway is um, just before the co-main. And then, of course, in the main event, Alex Perea versus Jamal Hill. This is a good one. Jamal, Jamal Hill was the champion, got injured, never lost the title. And then Alex Perea won the um, interim light heavyweight title. So they're going to fight in the main event. And while you're talking about it, just as an FYI, Alex Perea is minus 145, Jamal Hill plus 115, slight favor for Perea. Over under, one and a half rounds, minus 160 on the over, plus 130 on the under, one, one and a half rounds. Interesting How, line. When was the last fight? Inactivity might come into play here. When was the, because of the injury, when was the last fight for Hill? Jamal Hill's last fight was on January 21st, 2023. So he's out over a year. Yeah, I mean, that's going to play in a little bit. And before he got hurt, he's on a four-fight winning streak with the last fight coming against Tex Texera, unanimous decision for the title. Both fights, both fighters love to strike. That's their forte, um, standing, striking. But they're both... Very good with their legs, with kicking. Uh, Pereira's incredible, damaging your legs. He can take your legs away with his leg kicks. Um, they're, they're both good with their legs, obviously. Pereira, being a former kickboxer, is great with his punching, with his striking. Uh, 
Pereira is, is a smaller guy who moved up. Hill's the naturally bigger guy, but the guy with more power is the smaller guy who was naturally smaller. Pereira, he's he's got more power, I think, uh, where that left hook is very dangerous that he throws, very powerful, very explosive. As I said, both guys, their forte is striking, but they have both have learned to be have very good takedown defenses where they can survive takedowns, they can handle their own in the takedown positions, um, but they do like to do it on their feet, striking. Both guys can counterpunch, both guys can lead with their punches. Pereira's a, a really good counterpuncher where if you get a little reckless with him, if Hill gives up his height, gets a little too aggressive, he better be careful and not walk into a counter left hook of Pereira because Pereira is dangerous, really dangerous with those counters. Um, I think sometimes Pereira does go straight back. That could put him in harm's way a little bit, pull him back. I think the advantage here for Hill is his length. Uh, both guys have good height and good length, but Hill is a little taller, a little longer, uh, I believe I don't have the I don't have the breakdowns, the physical breakdowns in front of me, but from what I've seen on film, Hill is a guy that's not only got that long wingspan, he knows how to use it. They're both they're both six four, two oh five. Yeah, what, what the length is what I'm do you have their their arms? The yeah, reach uh, reach is both equal at seventy nine inches. All right, that's, see, that's interesting. I thought Hill was a little longer. Um, they both know how to use their length. I'm going to say that Hill is mandated to using his a little bit more, where he's a little more disciplined with using his length. Sometimes Pereira will look to be aggressive. I mean, they both could do that, but Pereira will look to be aggressive in some spots uh, where it could serve him. It could also get him in trouble. Um, but Hill, I think, for the most part, understands where his bread is butted, and that's to be able to use his length, get full extension on his punches, and put full-length combinations together. He does a magnificent job putting combinations together. Magnificent. And he mixes in a beautiful uppercut where he's got you busy up top with the straight punches. All of a sudden, he'll split the guard with an uppercut. I I think that's where Hill's at his best when he gets full length on his punches, puts them together, controls the outside, um, maybe gets Pereira to be the aggressor and takes advantage by being able to maybe counter punch if Pereira comes forward. Uh, be able to, again, to keep Pereira at the end of his punches. It's the kind of fight where Hill cannot let up his concentration for a split second. If he does and he gets a little reckless, aggressive, just for a split second, he's liable to wake up in the locker room because that's how good Pereira is at counter-punching yep. and pulling fights out of the fire, which he's done. Uh, incredible, incredible. At the end of the day, I'm going to go again, just like with Max Holloway. I'm going to take the dog. I'm, I'm going to take the dog. That's, a show. That's one of the reasons why UFC is what it is and the brand that it is, um, that it's past boxing and ratings in so, many, so many, in so many ways because the underdog always has a chance to win. You can't say that all the time in boxing or you can't say it as much in boxing. Too often in boxing... The favorite is going to dominate. The house fighter is going to dominate the fight too often. Unless you got the big fights. That's a little different. Like the other night, you had Hitchens and Lemos. You had the favorite uh, Hitchens. But it was a very competitive fight. But here's the problem. Yeah, it was competitive. But it didn't matter. Because the judges were going to go with the house fighter. And... Yep. It's a little That's right. look. UFC gets its problems with judging too. Uh, they're not uh, they're not devoid of that problem, but they're better. They're a little better with it. And um, at the end of the day, you do see more upsets in UFC, where it's because even if they got five losses, ten losses, eight losses, whatever, those guys are fire tested. 
They those losses right. helped them get prepared to win the big fight. And those losses ensure that they are always got a chance to win a fight no matter who they're in there with because they've been in there with the best. They've been tested. They learned their trade. Uh, I can see Pereira being a favorite. I understand it. I get it. He's been more active. Hill's coming off the inactivity, off the off the injury. But I'm going to go with Hill. I'm going to go Hill and over. Uh, I'm going to say the fight's going to go the distance. Yeah, I like it. That's a very thorough breakdown. If you're going to wager on the fight, please go to mybookie.ag and use the promo code ATLAS. Terry, thank you for the breakdown. You excited for uh, to get out to Vegas and see uh, your son in UFC 300? It'll be an exciting trip, although tough with the knee. Uh, I'll be fine. I'm blessed. Like I said, I have a lot of good people helping me. A lot of good people have been praying for me. Uh, I, I'm, I'm thankful for all the good people out there. The bad people, I don't even know you're around. I don't even know you're Sam. I don't even know they're around. I don't. I don't even notice them. It's like a uh, what they call that saying: the water runs off the duck of a back, the back of a duck. I'm sorry, right? Yeah. It's like that. The, the, <laughs> yeah, exactly. The bad people roll right off my back, like 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 water off a duck. That's it. But um, no, I I'm 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 glad to be out there covering it for UFC. Uh, I mean, covering the UFC for ESPN. Uh, it's a great product. You get nothing but great fights, the best fighting each other. That's what makes the UFC stand out. You got the best fighting each other. I mean, in boxing, sometimes yeah. it's like we got to celebrate it like a solar eclipse when you get the best fighting the best. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, oh my God, we yeah, got right. we're finally getting this fight. You know, but um, and we're getting more of now, and a lot of it due to the. To really, quite yep. frankly, to the Saudis and to Turkey Al Sheik, um, that that they're giving us those fights. But uh, we we got to get more of the best fight in the best. But UFC's got it down pat. They got the best fight in the pat best. But what makes it, like I said earlier, really exciting for me is I'm going out there and I'm going to be around good people, all the people involved in the broadcast, all the former champions, all the announcers, Charlie Monahan, everybody. The they make it fun to be with them. And and then the cherry yeah. on top of the cake is my son and my grandson. I'm going to be out there and I see, my, obviously, I also see my daughter-in-law. But my grandson and yeah. my son are going to be out there with me. Matter of fact, they're going to have a room right next door to my room. Um, oh, which, nice. Which is, you know, really going to be great. Um, thanks to Dawn and Cheyenne setting that up for me. Like I said, I'm blessed. I have a lot yeah. of good people around me. I'm gonna see. I'm gonna see my family. My wife's coming with me, by the way, uh, so, oh, so she nice. can be around our grandson too. And uh, it's my wife's birthday on Sunday, the day after the fight. So it uh, it'll be nice. Oh, that'll be yeah, fun. It'll be nice. Well, listen, safe travels out there. Enjoy the show. I know uh, I know it's going to be a good card, if nothing else. And uh, we'll look forward to being with everyone next Tuesday and break down all the action. Thank you to everyone for being with us. Please like and subscribe to the video and like and subscribe to the channel on YouTube. And we will be back with you next week. Have a great week, everyone.